And let's see, let me, uh, can, can everybody see my screen? I just want to make sure. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, well, to Liz, Gail, the rest of the uh, Clackamas River Basin Council Board, um, just pleased to be here. I saw a number of familiar names when we all came up on the screen here, and I'm really glad to see uh, a number of you, so to speak, uh, attending this evening. So as Liz suggested, uh, I've been doing work in the Clackamas River Basin for quite some time now, about 20 years now, but I should concede that these days I'm spending most of my time on the East Coast. So it's about nine o'clock in the evening for me, just a little after. So if I get a little heavy eyed or slur a few words here and there, please forgive me. It's a matter of me being three hours ahead of everybody else out there on the West Coast. So uh, without further ado, I do wanna get into the talk. I don't know how long it's gonna take. I'm guessing 30 or 40 minutes. And if we can get through it all in a timely manner, uh, happy to stick around for a while and take some questions. So um, as Liz suggested, um, I'm going to be discussing tonight, really exploring the influence of a changing landscape and altered hydrology on the aquatic invertebrate communities and their habitat in the Clackamas River Basin and beyond. Uh, for some reason, I'm not able to get, there we go, I'm getting my slide to advance here. So as far as content tonight, I'm going to start with, uh, or, or through it, I'm going to discuss the effects of the various landscape characteristics uh, in, in, the, in the landscape surrounding our rivers and streams, and the attendant hydrology on stream morphology and stream habitat in the Clackamas River Basin and beyond. I'm going to provide an overview of the river continuum concept and how longitudinal changes in food sources affect the structure and function of river ecosystems. I'm also gonna discuss that briefly in the context of what's called the serial discontinuity concept that we'll get into uh, a little bit after a brief overview of the river continuum concept and how it relates to the Clackamas River because of the presence of dams. Uh, we'll also briefly review uh, urbanization effects on watershed attributes, in particular hydrologic function and the attendant cascade of effects that we see on the geomorphic conditions of streams, rivers and streams, I should say, uh, attendant effects on habitat and water chemistry, then of course, ultimately, uh, those uh, cumulative effects on the biology. From there, we're gonna go into an overview of stormwater runoff impacts as they relate to urban water bodies and their effects on aquatic life. Uh, and then I'm going to review a few select studies that essentially document the effects of urbanization and what we call impervious cover uh, on river habitat and river ecology. And then finally, I'm going to provide just a brief overview with a few slides of some uh, stormwater solutions that we can all implement, even as landowners, to help improve the health of local rivers. Okay, so to start, um, I'm, I'm gonna cover a fair amount this evening and I, I should just say that uh, some of it may be pretty elementary to some of you folks. Uh, hopefully we've got some new information in here for everybody, but because of the nature of the talk and that is kind of the interrelationships between uh, the landscape and um, the, the river processes, the geomorphology, that is the, the shape and condition of the river, hydrology, physical habitat, water chemistry, and biology. Because we're trying to bring all of this together, we do have a fair amount to talk about. So I'm not really going to go too far into the weeds with respect to any of these single topics, but I'd more or less like to explore and explain how these all kind of fit together to create the physical template upon which the uh, invertebrates and other critters in the, liver, in the rivers live. So as far as the fluvial landscape, uh, I like to say that the valley shapes the river, which in turn shapes the landscape. And that's to say that there's not a one-way dynamic here. Um, you know, starting from, from headwater down through the mid reaches, the mid order reaches and into the high order, uh, lowland reaches of a river system within, within the watershed, we have this interplay between the valley or the landscape within which the river sits and the river itself. So in the headwater sections of a river or in a, in a, in a watershed, uh, 
These headwater streams, they swiftly flow down the mountain slopes and they cut deep, wide V-shaped valleys. The waterfalls and rapids occur in these zones and, and, and very, very high abundance in many cases. Uh, as the river moves into mid-order reaches, and those are typically third to fifth order reaches, we get into the lower elevation sections of valleys and the rivers, these small first and second and third order streams, they merge to, to flow down more gentle slopes. In these reaches, the, uh, the rivers and the streams, they tend to be gentler gradient. They have a better, uh, more heterogeneous mix of uh, riffles and pulls and runs. And this is where, in these intermediate sections is where you tend to have the highest biodiversity because the habitat template there tends to be most heterogeneous. As you move into the lower reaches of the watershed, you get into these higher order uh, river segments, the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th order rivers, as large as the Columbia River, for example. And in these lower elevation areas, the river becomes more sinuous. It interacts a lot more extensively with the floodplain. Uh, and it, at the river's mouth, it may divide into separate channels and actually anastomose, as you see here in this illustration. So, the first concept that I just really want to try to convey here is that a river's morphology is very tightly connected to its adjacent landscape. And the morphology in most places in the US, in the Pacific Northwest and in the Northeast, for example, it tends to follow a very predictable pattern, morphologically speaking. So we can actually also say that as far as energy inputs into the, into the river system. Um, Back in the 1980s, the river continuum concept was proposed as a series of hypotheses that basically explain how the river functions as a series of physical gradients, or as a, essentially, yes, a, a series of physical gradients, in particular channel dimensions and the riparian canopy. Uh, with respect to those two elements, the river is constantly changing, or the watershed, from the headwater streams down through the midsections into the lower parts of the basin, it's constantly changing in a relatively predictable manner. And changes in the energy uh, go from essentially a, largely a lochness in the uh, higher elevation headwater areas where most of the energy sources being a lochness are coming from outside the system that is outside the stream. So in this case, we're getting a lot of coarse particulate organic matter in the, in the form of say leaves and barks and coarse woody debris. And the, in turn, the invertebrate community in these areas will respond and be comprised primarily of critters that take advantage of the energy sources coming from those allochthonous sources that is outside the river or stream itself. As we head into the mid reach sections of a watershed, uh, we find that now, Again, because these gradients in channel size and, uh, and, and canopy openings, because the channel is getting wider, the canopy is becoming more open, we tend to see more of what's called autochthonous uh, energy production, that is in stream or in river primary production. And in these mid river reaches, it's often in the form of diatoms and uh, in some cases, perhaps macrophytes. And again, the invertebrate community is we're seeing accompanying shifts in the, what we call the trophic condition of the community, or in the case of macroinvertebrates, we often refer to this as the functional feeding condition as a result of changes in the functional feeding composition of the invertebrates. Finally, as we move down into these lowest reaches of the watershed, and I should mention right now that the Clackamas River really represents these mid-level reaches or these mid-order reaches. and and places like the lower Willamette River and certainly the Columbia River, they represent these, these highest order, very low elevation, low gradient, highly sinuous, uh, very wide meandering river reaches where much of the production is, it's still um, autochthonous, but now it's largely in the form of uh, say filamentous algae and paraphyton. And so we see yet other changes, attendant changes in the trophic condition or in the trophic structure of the invertebrate community. In this case, in these highest order reaches, because we see this shift to the um, 
uh, the the, the paraphyton and the uh, filamentous algae, we get a lot of filters and collectors. And again, these, these shifts in functional feeding composition in the invertebrate community, they do occur in quite a predictable manner in most cases. Now, I say in most cases because there are criticisms of the river continuum concept. And as I mentioned down here, they include not being able to account for human disturbance. And human disturbance, as we all well know, is very critical. It's a very critical element in the Clackamas River Basin. Throughout, um, we have a lot of forestry activity in the upper basin. And then, of course, we have agriculture and urbanization, even more disruptive threats in the lower basin. So uh, the, the criticisms of the RCC, again, include not being able to account for or effectively model or incorporated uh, human influence into what otherwise is kind of a neat and tidy set of hypotheses that uh, predict these changes in both uh, river morphology and then the intended changes in the trophic structure. So along comes a few years after the river continuum concept, what was called or what is called the serial discontinuity concept. And that largely relates to dams. And we have three dams on the Clackamas River, for example. We've got Faraday, uh, Mill River, and there is uh, the, the North Fork Dam. So those, the, the presence of those dams, uh, they, they, we, I think we all know, they certainly do disrupt thermal and flow regimes. They uh, create changes in water quality. They certainly create changes in substrate conditions um, and then attendant changes to the biology and, and energy. So we see changes in the paraphyte and we see changes in the invertebrate community structure. And then in some cases, because of limiting fish, pa fish passage, potentially, we see changes in the fish community as well. Worth mentioning because again, um, where I'm going with all of this is just trying to paint with broad brush strokes the relationship between the river and its position on the landscape as well as the landscape characteristics around the river with respect to both uh, influencing the river's character at that location as far as size and morphological condition, habitat conditions, but also as far as the energy sources for that section of river. Those energy sources change largely in a predictable manner, depending on where that river segment is in the watershed. But the presence of dams and other human influences can certainly disrupt the predictive ability of, say, for example, the river continuum concept. OK, so when we talk about healthy loading ecosystems, healthy rivers and streams, they're certainly characterized by these robust structural elements in both the, the biology and the habitat. We see biologically rich and diverse communities. We see heterogeneous and stable habitat. And they also have uh, these rivers and streams when they're in a healthy, relatively undisturbed condition. They also have very well functioning functional attributes in undisturbed settings. Um, and perhaps the, one of the most important functional attributes is the ability to effectively transport both water and sediment um, in a manner that allows the water and sediment to kind of move continuously through the system and that allows energy to be kind of evenly dispersed uh, as, it, as, as the water and sediment move through the system. And we call this a dynamic equilibrium that allows relative stability in the river channel itself. And that in turn is what provides diverse habitat for rich and abundant communities of native species. So when we look at the various trophic levels and, and the various groups of what constitutes um, diverse native communities in the Clackamas River and beyond, of course, we need to start with the primary producers. And diatoms and soft-bodied algae dominate rivers and streams. Uh, Again, we do get macrophytes in some river reaches, but the diatom communities in particular are very diverse in undisturbed settings. They're not as commonly studied as our macroinvertebrate communities, largely because they're not as easily seen, quite frankly. 
Um, but there, it is an emerging discipline. Uh, more and more work is, do, is being done to examine relationships between water quality, physical habitat conditions, and, and, and diatom community condition. So they are an integral part of the, um, of the larger community of the ecology in the Clackamas River. And then, of course, I think I've mentioned, or maybe Liz mentioned, that the macroinvertebrates are most of what I spend my time studying. Uh, they're of great interest to many people for a number of reasons. They certainly are a vital component in aquatic communities. They provide a link between the primary production, whether it's, again, a lochthinous material coming in in the form of leaves and bark, um, or stuff produced within the river system, such as paraphyton and plankton. Uh, they're that link between the primary production and the higher predators, such as fish and amphibians. And they tend to occur in, in quite high abundance, and they're also quite diverse. And I mentioned down here, in a single reach, in, in fact, in a single riffle, in a single habitat type within uh, say a Clackamas River reach, we may have 100 species or more in a healthy system or a healthy part of the Clackamas River watershed. So they really are quite impressive as far as their diversity. Um, I should also just mention briefly that they, they tend to be most widely used in assessing ecological condition because they just lend very well to it. One, again, they're visible to the naked eye. Uh, owing to their diversity by virtue of who's home and who's not home, we can infer not only in many cases, uh, the condition, the overall ecological condition and function, functioning of that river segment from which the sample was collected, but we can also sometimes make inferences based on who's home and who's not home about the nature of the disturbance. Are we seeing a lot of critters missing that tend to be uh, intolerant of high water temperatures? Are we seeing uh, a lot of critters missing, a lot of taxa missing who tend to be intolerant of elevated sediment loads? So the, the invertebrates can really paint a compelling picture. And they're a lot easier to sample uh, than fish are by virtue of just getting out there and, and kicking around with a kick net in a few riffle segments, quite literally, rather than the extensive effort that most of us know is required for sampling fish communities. But let's not forget the fish communities. They are the, you know, the top of the aquatic food chain in most rivers and streams. Uh, the Clackamas River and its tributaries, I think we all know, support a number of trout and salmon species. And for, for that reason, among many others, uh, it's imperative that we do continue to do good work to um, maintain physical, uh, chemical and biological integrity in the Clackamas River watershed. So stressors and disturbed settings, they, they tend to produce obviously deviations in these structural biological attributes. That is the, the, the structure and the composition of the diatom communities, the invertebrate communities and the fish communities. Uh, they, the, this can often occur in a predictable manner in relation to the kinds of disturbances that we see. So as far as these stressors, particularly in urban settings, uh, let's look at how this occurs. So I know this is pretty elementary to most all of us. Uh, I won't go through the whole hydrologic cycle, but I do want to point out or reiterate for some of us that most disturbance to uh, loading systems begins as hydrologic in nature. And you know, when we think of the hydrologic cycle, most of us think of evapotranspiration or evaporation or condensation that forms clouds and of course precipitation. But perhaps the most important element with respect to uh, its influence on changing um, basically hydrologic functioning of rivers and streams is infiltration. It's, it's the amount of water that reaches the groundwater table and is stored for later release that really heavily influences not only obviously the hydrologic condition of rivers, rivers and streams, but also the geomorphic condition and then the cascading effects to habitat, water quality and biology. And that's what I wanna get into a little bit next. So if we look at a typical water budget for forested land cover. And a water budget just basically explains where water goes when it falls on the land surface. Uh, 
For forested land cover, we see that as little as, and this number obviously varies with the, the landscape and the type of vegetation and the, and the underlying soil and geology. This particular figure references 0.3%. I think that tends to be on the low side. I think it's anywhere between this number and perhaps as high as five or 10%, but nevertheless, a relatively small amount of water in forested settings occurs as surface runoff. Most of it occurs as groundwater, or I should say moves into it, infiltrates the, uh, the, the landscape as groundwater. Now compare that to an urbanized landscape where now we get about 15% of what's falling on the land surface, 15% of that precipitation infiltrating is groundwater. And in this example, 30% now occurring is surface runoff. So this is, just, this is just one example. Obviously these numbers can vary, but I just wanna illustrate how the water budget changes with respect to urbanization. And it's essentially that run surface runoff increases in some cases quite dramatically, groundwater infiltration or infiltration into the groundwater uh, decreases quite a bit. So where, where does this come from or what causes this? And it's really all about impervious cover. Uh, and impervious cover is, as the name suggests, it's any cover on the land surface that doesn't allow water to infiltrate, but essentially only allows water to move across its surface to find that next surface where it can eventually move somewhere else, preferably into uh, the groundwater table. So impervious cover includes parking lots, rooftops, roads, et cetera. Now, under natural conditions, again, as we said earlier, as I mentioned in the last slide, you know, we get about 10% often less surface runoff under natural conditions, forested conditions. When impervious cover increases to say 10 to 20%, then surface runoff increases to 20%. And again, 35 to 40% impervious cover, surface runoff increases to 30%. 75 to 100% impervious cover, which would be say downtown Portland, Oregon, surface runoff increases to 55%. So the relationship between impervious cover and where that water's going is obviously very important. So the problem here is that this impervious cover creates this altered hydrologic condition. And we, we all know that urban development results in a lot of impervious cover and pipes to effectively transport what's falling on that impervious cover to the nearest surface water. At least that's what occurred historically and still occurs in some cases. So imperviousness and connecting those impervious surfaces directly to surface water via the pipes, it obviously significant, it significantly interrupts the hydrologic cycle. So, I think collectively we, I mean, we being stewards, water resource managers, um, citizens and residents, we, we need to each do what we can to just preserve and restore to the extent we can natural watershed hydrology and to restore and protect existing water quality and provide resilience to future change. And of course, you know, a lot of the jurisdictions really work hard to do that with their stormwater management programs. But we as landowners can um, work on that as well. And I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. So just to briefly review what happens during storms, uh, the roofs, driveways, roads, they drain to these catch basins, which in turn oftentimes discharge directly into surface waters and they carry pollutants, they can increase flooding and erosion, and they can obviously potentially damage water supplies and spoil community uses, such as fishing, swimming. Um, so the problem is ubiquitous in urban areas. And again, you know, some urban areas are doing a magnificent job, especially with new developments at addressing these issues and retrofitting. Uh, stormwater systems to better address these issues. But it is a pervasive issue that um, continues to, to plague our uh, rivers and streams nationwide. So to understand um, basically how impervious cover and the resulting hydrologic changes affect flows in rivers and streams, uh, this is what's called a hydrograph. And the, uh, the, the y-axis here 
I have it labeled as the flow rate. Otherwise, it's called discharge. That's the amount of water moving by a certain spot per unit time. In many cases, this is expressed as cubic feet of water per second. So in this case, we, the red line represents an urban watershed, an urbanized watershed, or I should say an urban stream. And what we see here is a peak discharge as a result of a storm in that urban stream. And what happens is we get a lot more water immediately entering the stream than we do here in a forested stream. So this would be a hydrograph for the same amount of rain in a forested stream. And you can see here how we're getting just a lot less flow, a much lower peak flow during the peak uh, period of rain or discharge of rain into the river. And we also get, this isn't very well portrayed here, but the, the downward end of this is called the receding leg. And typically in a forested system, the receding leg uh, drags out, if you will, a lot further than it does uh, in, a, in a hydrograph for a, uh, an urban watershed. So essentially what happens is the water all moves through at once. So we get these higher highs and we get these lower lows. So when it rains, the urban streams have too much water and the water's then gone because it doesn't enter the groundwater table for later uh, continuous slower release. So we get both a change in the height and a change in the width, the lag time and the amplitude. So the consequences to uh, rivers as a result of this, again, we can have severe flooding uh, during the peak of these storm flows. And then on the other end of the extreme, we can have severe drought. And we all know what kind of dry conditions Western Oregon or throughout the West we experience these days and urban areas uh, as a result of stormwater management, urban areas just experience exacerbated conditions in this respect. So I wanted to really focus there on the hydrology for a few minutes because again, as I emphasized earlier on, it really does seem these changes begin with altered hydrology. Um, you know, we have the urbanization, the change in the landscape, the impervious cover, infiltration rates decrease, runoff increases, and then it's all about hydro modification from there. We get the higher peak flows, we get the lower base flows, and as a result, channel morphology changes largely in response to these higher peak flows. The, the channel is essentially responding to being able to accommodate more water now. So we get scour and incision, we get erosion, we get more deposition where we shouldn't be getting it, and we get a loss of connectivity between the river channel itself and the floodplain. And all of this amounts to attendant changes in in-stream physical habitat. Generally speaking, habitat condition and complexity are both gonna decrease. We're gonna have changes in substrate, which almost always uniformly result in deleterious effects to the biology because we lose coarse substrate. Um, we get a lot more fine substrate that results in embeddedness that is essentially fouling of the coarse substrates by fine substrates such as sand and silt. Then in addition to the physical habitat uh, degradation that occurs, we see changes in water chemistry. And then of course, we can also see changes in riparian conditions as a result of the down cutting. And then uh, ultimately in, in many cases, once a channel down cuts, the bank, banks become unstable, the channel widens, which becomes very detrimental to the riparian zone. The, ripar the um, canopy opens up, and as a result of the incision and down cutting, the riparian vegetation no longer has access to the water table because the water table has dropped. So we tend to see less lush vegetation in these impaired areas in many cases. And all of this, uh, all of these, um, uh, all of these, I should say, myriad and interacting effects um, or changes ultimately obviously affect the biological communities. In, in various and, um, and, and many detrimental ways.
So to start with uh, effects on fish habitat, we'll talk a little bit about effects on water chemistry as well. I've mentioned here the relationships between the, the hydrology, the geomorph, and the habitat. Well, these geomorphic changes that we see as a result of hydro modification, in particular the lateral and vertical erosion and the sedimentation, these obviously create drastically different habitat conditions for fish and vertebrates and the primary producers. We see incision, we see widening, um, we see a loss of habitat complexity, we see a loss of large woody debris. So it just, it all spells havoc for uh, biological life. And we do have urban streams uh, in Lower Clackamas County that um, in, in some places um, look this severely damaged. Um, we also see this in other places uh, in the Portland metro area, particularly over in the Tualatin River Valley. So as far as effects on water quality, um, you know, streets do effectively act as first order ephemeral tributaries, right? I mean, they're conveying water during storms to, in many cases, uh, larger surface water bodies. And in doing so, they're also delivering sediment and a potential laundry list of pollutants. So sediment, um, pollutants that will increase biological oxygen demand and take that raw, starve, I should say, the river of oxygen necessary for uh, all kinds of biological functioning. Uh, all kinds of toxics, that list is even too long to read at this point. Uh, debris, various nutrients, of course, bacterial uh, and uh, other path pathogens, and then thermal stress. And thermal stress can be uh, a very significant one, especially at times of year, such as what we're experiencing right now, both on the East and West coasts. So all of this amounts to what is now called urban streams um, multiple stress syndrome. So this refers to, uh, and again, this is primarily occurring in urban streams, but can occur in suburban areas and even rural areas. We have these combined effects of altered hydrology, altered water quality, and altered stream morphology, which cumulatively obviously result in very poor aquatic life. And as you can well imagine, these interacting and cumulative effects, they're, they're working with each other. Uh, oftentimes there are many uh, co-occurring stressors. So it can be very difficult to identify which of these stressors, which one or more of them is most significantly affecting stream functioning and, and aquatic life in any given time. So one approach is to manage the overall impact of urbanization rather than the specific stressors associated with it. Uh, for example, by establishing limits on say impervious cover uh, in new urbanizing areas. So essentially addressing impervious cover, it amounts to addressing multiple stress syndrome at its source. So as far as impervious cover and how it relates to stream quality, what do we actually know? Well, there's actually a pretty good body of um, information out there. There have been numerous studies conducted over the last number of decades uh, that show that show strong relationships between impervious cover, biological condition, um, in-stream habitat, and, and, um, and other attributes as far as uh, stream conditions. So it's, it's in-stream cover certainly is an excellent indicator of development impacts. And again, those impacts largely resulting from the effects of stormwater. So what's interesting is the studies largely show a strong correlation between stream quality and in-stream cover. And most of the impacts actually occur at the lower end of the um, impervious cover range. So it doesn't take much impervious cover to really start to see a decline in stream quality by whatever measure one chooses to use. And so let's look at that for a moment. As far as indicators or measures, um, these this is a list of studies that over the last, well, it looks like most of these studies occurred back in the 90s. So, you know, plus or 25 or 30 years ago, um, many of these indicators you can see aquatic habitat, 
decreased large woody debris found in streams at around 10%. Uh, fish habitats, channel, to, channel stability, they all started declining rapidly after 10%. Stream temperature increased directly with each one degree, or I'm sorry, with each, not with each, but just with percent impervious cover changes. Uh, aquatic insects declined in condition uh, starting at around eight to nine percent, or as wetlands, I should say, increase in impervious cover uh, to eight to nine percent. So I guess my point here is that across the board here, these changes that we see in um, indicators of aquatic conditions, they tend to occur at relatively low impervious cover percents. So again, it, it doesn't take much. And just as a specific example, here is a study from Connecticut, their Department of Environmental Protection. And I think they essentially just took all their biomonitoring data and uh, related that to impervious cover in the upstream drainage area. And you can see, I mean, it, there's a lot of spread here, but the overall relationship there is, is pretty good. And each 2% increase in impervious cover resulted in a six point decrease in the multi-metric index score, which is a, basically it's an aggregate or composite score of overall uh, ecological conditions as indicated by macro invertebrate communities. So, quite clear relationships. So if we now look at uh, a couple of studies that I did uh, almost 20 years ago now, these, these are from the Twalton River Basin. Um, data from 2001, um, for some reason I have the X and Y axes uh, inversed here and I'm, I'm sorry about that folks. The, the, response, the response variable should be over here on the Y axis, but just bear with me. So in this case, the response vari variable, the multi-metric score, which reflects overall uh, macro invertebrate community condition, uh, it, it's uniformly high when uh, essentially impervious cover is low. So the best IBI scores are uniformly as well, not uniformly, but they're, they're associated with, with low impervious cover. However, when we get to uh, these er this area here, with, with these lower multi-metric scores indicating lower biological conditions, you can see that some multi-metric scores are low when impervious cover is actually low. Well, I so for some reason I did this with the 2005 data. I don't know if I did with the 2001 data, but here we have, uh, again, on the y-axis, the response variable, on the x-axis, the predictor variable. But in this case, it's urban land use, um, which could be used as a surrogate for impervious cover. And we see here that um, there, there are some sites with very high land use scoring the same as the less urbanized sites. So, so why would that be? And ultimately, if we account for both urban and agricultural land use, we see now that this relationship becomes a lot more uh, distinct or clear, if you will. So my point here is that um, we also have to be taking into account disturbance that occurs in these agricultural settings and impervious cover is not going to account for that directly. So we're not always going to see uniformly good conditions when impervious cover is low, simply as a result of the effects of agricultural uh, practices, and in some case, even forestry practices. Uh, here's, here are a couple more examples from the lower Willamette and Clackamas River tributary streams. Uh, more examples of relationships between, in this case, uh, ag and urban land use combined, and uh, overall biological condition based on macro invertebrate community scores. You can see the relationship is pretty tight. There is a little bit of spread here, but uh, you, can, you can see the, the broader relationship there between land use and uh, overall biological condition. And this figure is showing essentially the inverse of that based on uh, percent forested land use, where we see biological condition improving with uh, attendant uh, increases in percent forested land use. All right, and I see we're, we're really getting along here and I apologize for the length of this. I think I'm gonna move along just a little faster because it is 
10 of 7, going on 10 o'clock my time. So thanks for bearing with me, for, folks. And um, I will move just a little faster through these remaining slides. So I, I do want to just talk briefly about uh, what the different physical habitat template looks like uh, in streams with upstream watershed areas uh, with varying amounts of impervious cover. So when impervious cover is low, we're going to see stream characteristics that include a stable channel, um, heterogeneous habitat, heterogeneous substrate, large wetted perimeter during base flow. Essentially, the aquatic life is, is happy there, and the riparian condition is in good shape as well. Uh, now, in this case, the impervious cover has increased to perhaps 10%. The stream channel is increasing in width to accommodate higher flows. You can see there's some lateral incision occurring by virtue of these tree roots being exposed. Now there's a smaller wetted perimeter during base flows or low flows, and the habitat heterogeneity is being lost. So now we're starting to see um, some deleterious effects to aquatic life. Now in these heavily urbanized areas um, with higher amounts of impervious cover, the geomorphic and physical effects become um, pretty pronounced and very obvious. In fact, this is this is Seaman Creek right here in the lower Clackamas River. This is situated between uh, Rock Creek and Mount Scott Creek, and and so incised that when you're standing in the bottom of this, you, I, I think you could put one person on another person's shoulders, maybe even three people standing on top of each other, and you wouldn't be able to look over the bank of this. It's so disconnected from its floodplain. So, uh, you know, in these, in these highly disturbed settings, we see active erosion, both vertical and lateral, uh, significantly decreased substrate um, quality, loss of riparian function, further loss of habitat quality, um, and then, of course, the incision leads to a uh, disconnection from the floodplain. All right, just real quick, um, I want to just speak to the diversity of invertebrate communities in forested streams. Uh, in these intact systems, forested streams essentially often equate with um, stable systems with heterogeneous habitat, um, stable thermal regimes. And we end up seeing a lot of the more sensitive orders of invertebrates, including stoneflies, mayflies, and caddisflies. In fact, they often dominate um, those systems. In an urban stream, the invertebrate community obviously looks very different, both functionally and compositionally. We see a lot of snails. Um, the scuds are freshwater crustaceans, um, fewer predators, um, more parasites, and a lot of dipterins and beetles. I won't go too far into this one. I just wanted to briefly mention that over the last couple of decades, a number of folks have done a lot of biomonitoring work with invertebrates in the Clackamas River Basin. And what I want to point out here is the circles being tributary sites and these few squares being main stem Clackamas River sites. Uh, you can see the, the red circles indicate uh, most disturbed biological conditions and the green circles indicate uh, least disturbed biological conditions. And, and take note, that the least disturbed conditions, while still intermingled with uh, higher disturbance reaches, they tend to occur almost exclusively in the forested areas, with a few exceptions, with a few small tributaries down here. Um, and, and that particular area actually may be forested, I, I don't really know. But the relationships here at the landscape level are, are pretty clear. Once we get down into these urbanized and agricultural areas just as a result of the changes in morphology and hydrology and attendant water quality and physical habitat, the, the effects on the biology are pronounced. So I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, we as landowners, we can do a lot uh, in our own yards to improve hydrologic functioning. Um, in our watersheds and what goes into our rivers and streams. Low impact development, it's something that um, we can all participate in, whether it's rain barrels, uh, planting more ground cover, uh, we can have rain gardens, have porous paving, uh, plant trees and shrubs. We do see a lot of this in the Portland metro area these days, and uh, it, it certainly will be beneficial. Just a few low impact development examples. I, I really like the porous 
pavement blocks. Uh, and again, you see more and more of that these days. Another example is a detention or infiltration basin with a rain garden rather than stormwater discharging directly into a river or stream. Water is discharged into this infiltration basin, giving the water an opportunity to indeed infiltrate into the groundwater table. And this street has it all. It's got um, now all of those elements that we like to see in hydrologically friendly neighborhoods, if you will. So I'll just close with you know saying that one way to look at this is to make that connection. The the urbanization in particular that leads to this cascade of events, almost kind of a chain reaction of sorts. You have the increased impervious area, increased stormwater, altered hydrology, altered geomorph and habitat and chemistry, which ultimately results in these uh, consequential biological effects. So we can stop this at its source. In many cases, we disconnect the chain of events at or near the source. Uh, you know, we, I think historically too often focused on the symptoms such as repairing eroding banks and planting trees and whatnot um, along the rivers themselves and not the sources, which is essentially uh, managing stormwater at its source and making sure that it goes to the right place at the right time. So I'm gonna stop there. Uh, and again, I, I really appreciate everyone's attention to this. I wouldn't blame you if, if you stepped away. We're going on seven o'clock here, but I'm, I'll be happy to stick around for some Q&A if anyone's interested. I'll ask a question. Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so, to what extent, when you have a, a reach, stream reach that's you know altered and not functioning well, uh, how much downstream reach of repair? You know, I know that this stormwater flow and the pulse of impervious surfaces is going to last a long time. But at what point can a downstream reach repair from the upstream, and therefore it flows on in better shape from there? Uh, so just to understand, you're asking about repair of a downstream reach in relation to... I'm, I'm saying if a stream is degraded upstream, but you have a mm -hmm. long stretch of, you know, properly functioning, better watershed downstream, you know, how, how far do you have to go before it actually, you know, is repaired because of the upstream influence is going to last, you know, it's, you know, higher flow, you change the hydrology, but at some point it would dissipate. So to what extent can we mitigate an unrepairable upstream uh, degradation with just doing better downstream? Uh, that's a really good question. And I don't think there is any one single answer to that because it's gonna depend on many different variables and, and largely relating to the scale that is the size of the disturbance upstream and the magnitude of that. That is, you know, how, how large are those uh, higher flows coming through and how much sediment is being delivered into the downstream reach? Right, so what you're able to mitigate is largely going to be um, itself hampered or limited by the extent of both spatially and as far as the magnitude of the disturbance upstream. So, you know, Liz, I, as a geomorphologist, I don't know if that's something that that you can speak to, but I'm I'm not involved in trying to model or uh, even conceptualize uh, those types of projects, if you will. Yeah, it, they're complex systems and, um, you know, you're dealing with changes in morphology. And so what we do with restoration is we try to um, fix some of those or fix uh, some of those impacts we see from the altered hydrology. So slow that flow down, deposit more sediment, but you still have those water quality issues and, and potentially temperature issues um, because of the upstream impacts. And that's much more challenging to address because it's all from disparate sources and kind of cumulative effects at that point. That's not a fair question when there's no definition of the scale. I, I, I know at smaller scale with small streams, you can have you know, maybe certain length of repair downstream and groundwater starts to infiltrate, water quality starts to improve, you know, water can be filtered by functioning riparian areas and then you can emerge with a somewhat repaired system when you have degradation in a small stream. But I don't think, I'd imagine, you know, the larger the scale, the, 
at some point you get out of the realm of possibility. But mm -hmm. I mean, there is a lot of mitigation downstream of a degraded area in small streams where it comes back, you know, it seems like it's working. Right, and I think that largely speaks to the limited extent of the disturbance upstream and being able to mitigate for those impacts because ultimately they just aren't all that substantial on that downstream reach. Um, I see a question here um, from Dave Bugney. Um, do you have a recommendation for further reading for a general audience on aquatic macroinvertebrates in our area and their sensitivities to pollution levels and what they tell us about the aquatic environment? Oh, there is, I think Reese Bochelle wrote an introduction to aquatic invertebrates. Um, if that's the correct author, that's that's a good one. And I do believe that's one that you can find on amazon.com. Um, Pat McCafferty wrote a book on aquatic insects probably 30 years ago now. And I think that had a similar name. Uh, I don't know if it's out of print, but there are a couple of good ones out there. And, and it might be worth a look on amazon.com because uh, you know, these days you can find even some of those, I guess you could say semi-technical books on Amazon for sure. But um, yeah, it was Reese Vochelle who wrote one, I believe, and Pat McCafferty who wrote another one. And they're, they're both good introductory texts to uh, invertebrate ecology in particular. You know, it, it's funny, I don't know that anyone could find this anymore, but back probably 30 years ago now, maybe more than that, um, there was a, a, a short book written by, I think it was Jody White at the Xerces Society. And I, it might've been called something like Stream Sentinels. And I, I saw that book when I was maybe 20 or 25 years old. And it's what inspired me to get into both invertebrate biomonitoring and to move to the Pacific Northwest after I finished graduate school. If anyone could get their hands on that book and the Xerces Society I imagine they may still have copies of that book. It is an excellent read and it's a short read and highly comprehensible and full of beautiful pictures that are very uh, relevant to the Pacific Northwest, obviously, because that's where the Xerces Society is, is based out of. They're, they're there in Portland. So that's an excellent one. And I'd say it might even be worth contacting the Xerces Society to see if they still have copies of it. I'll get those references from you and then we'll post them online. Okay. I have one more question in the chat, and then John Borden, I saw you raised your hand, so I'll get to you next. Um, from Laura Starling, in your cascade of events, does climate change affect any of the factors individually or as a group, exacerbating the chain of events? Well, obviously, climate change is going to affect the hydrologic portion of it most significantly, right? Because I don't think we know exactly how climate change is affecting precipitation patterns, right? And by precipitation patterns, we've got frequency, we've got duration, we've got intensity, which in turn amounts to, you know, total rainfall amounts and when that occurs and in what intensity it occurs. All of that is really going to, uh, or, or changes, I should say, all of those possible changes in precipitation patterns will certainly have uh, potentially very consequential effects on the hydrologic piece of this. And then that in turn is going to have those cascading effects uh, right through the rest of what we discussed. And at this point, I think it's pretty hard to predict exactly how that's gonna manifest, but um, it, it's, it's going to happen. There's almost no doubt. So I guess to answer the question, I, I see climate change primarily affecting the, the hydrologic portion of it. And then that in turn alternating, alternating that uh, or altering that cascade of effects. John, do you want to go ahead? Yes. Can you hear me with this particular thing? It's hard to hear. How, how's that? Is that better? That's better. Okay. Uh, I had an argument with a good friend of mine who was developing a property in the city of Canby. And he had quite a large lot and uh, he built buildings on it. And I convinced him to take his gutter water into sumps uh, around his property. We never hit cobbles or rock, but 
it had a deep depth of uh, good uh, uh, soil. So I assume that putting uh, his gutter water from the new structures into that deep soil was a good idea? It certainly sounds like it would be to me because ultimately that, that's gonna make its way into the groundwater table. Um, yeah, so if, I've, if I'm understanding you correctly, his gutter water was going deep into the soil layer. Is that correct? It wasn't, it wasn't occurring as runoff. It was occurring as runoff, but now it's going into soil maybe six feet deep. Right, so as a result of what he did, it was no longer occurring as runoff. I, I agree that that was a good move and, and it should be resulting in his water being returned directly to the groundwater table. Well done, John. <laughs> Any other questions for Mike? Okay, well, thank you so much. It's um, really great to be able to tie in the, the, the climate and the geology into the hydrology and then looking further at the ecological community in response to that. So thank you for putting that all into context. That was great. My pleasure. Thanks to everybody for listening. Yeah, so for everyone out there, thank you again for joining us. Um, the next session is on July 13th, and um, that's going to kick off the forestry sessions. Um, we'll have Steve Acker, John Kim, and Holly Kearns of the Forest Service, who will discuss historic, current, and future tree species distributions, forest types, and forest stressors within the Clackamas Basin. Um, and as always, you can use the same Zoom meeting link, um, and you're already registered. Um, we'll send you a thank you email with these links and the references that Mike mentioned, and then also information about getting that continuing education credit if you're interested. So thank you, Mike, for the wonderful talk. Um, thank you to all of the participants who joined us again. It's really great to see you. And thanks to our gold sponsor, Water Environment Services. Um, and to our sponsors, Clackamas River Water Providers and the Geological Society of the Oregon Country. Excellent organizations. Um, they're helping us keep this conference free for everyone um, and every little bit helps. So help if you can. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.